Also with us, and we'll go through them all in a minute when they've taken their seats, we're going to be talking about rights. So we've risk, we've rights. Olivier de Schutter, Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food for the Human Rights Council, is going to be talking us about that. And his partner is Dulcie Lorna Kalmatak, and she's the trainer for the Solar Dryer Project in Vanuatu. Um, and also with us, and just after signing a strategic partnership agreement with the World Food Programme, is our Agriculture Minister here in Ireland, Simon Coveney. He's partnered by Augustine Niamshi, who's Executive Director of Cameroon Bioresources Development and Conservation Programme. And our final theme this morning of empowerment will be dealt with by Earthrin Cousin. We've heard from you already this morning, inspiring us, Earthrin. And she has also just finished signing that agreement with Simon Coveney as director of the World Food Programme. And her partner is Cecilia Kibe, who's the Kenya coordinator of climate justice with women champions. So it's a great panel. And thank you all for joining us this morning. We're really grateful. So, Eric and William, um, can I ask you two to start the conversation about rights? You're, they're going to talk, each of them, to you for a short period of while. We'll take a vote. We'll move on through the various sets of speakers, and then we'll have a general discussion amongst everybody about the points that are being raised. Okay? So, Eric and William, the floor is yours. My, my sh <coughs> very short message is that it's all about two words, political will. We must mobilize that political will, top down, bottom up, uh, uh, through a conversation between all of us. Let me bring you to one place, a fantastic name, Kokri Mokri. It's in Bangladesh, and they are preparing for cyclones. In the, in the 1970s, a cyclone in Bangladesh killed 500,000 people. Today, they are much better prepared. For sure, it will still be devastating, but only, I mean only, but it's, it's the human suffering, but only a few thousand would have been killed if it were, were to happen today. Because they have prepared. Civil society is preparing, government is preparing, they are constructing houses, which means that the, the cyclone will pass under. Uh, that's a rich man's house, a community center, a school. So they are doing all the concrete stuff to prepare for this disaster done through society. And that's the race of the world today. On one hand, climate change is becoming more and more severe. On the other hand, civil society and states are much better prepared and organizing much better. And that is the race. We must make certain that we are preparing much better and preparing for the risk. Let me give you a few other examples to be practical. In El Salvador, Central America, the government has constructed a national disaster center monitoring all weather patterns in the Pacific, as well as in the Caribbean. They can get winds from both, uh, both sides. They are preparing for volcano, uh, uh, for volcano uh, emissions. They are preparing for uh, eruptions. They are preparing for uh, hurricanes, uh, for any sort of disaster. A couple of years back, they had 1.5 meters of rain in 10 days. That's Dublin weather for a year. In, one, in 10 days. Still, they manage because of this center and good, good preparedness. And that con can continue around the globe. A lot is happening. In Africa, Malawi, and many other nations are doing conser conservation agriculture, a good way of preparing for changing weather patterns uh, for agriculture. In Ethiopia, the government has put Ethiopia on a low carbon strategy the most impressive of any developing nation anywhere in the world, not, not only developing nation. In fact, it's the most uh, fantastic strategy of any nation. The Ethiopians are saying that we will become a mid middle income nation by 2025 without increasing climate gas emissions. For sure, there will be increases from the urban and, uh, uh, and industrial sector, but they will be, at the same time, a, a reduction from the agriculture and, and, from, uh, and from tree planting. So on balance, they will move ahead and providing livelihood to people without um, a new climate gas emissions. If they can pull that trick, what an achievement on behalf of humanity. And ending up, I've given you examples from Asia, Africa, Latin America, moving to Vietnam, probably the most successful nation in the world when it comes to agriculture over the last uh, two decades. 
in the 1990s, Vietnam was a huge importer of rice. Today, Vietnam is the second biggest rice exporter in the world. And they have done it not through rocket science, but through property rights, rural roads, better crops, and investment in agriculture, simply investing in the small-scale farmer. That was the message of President Higgins. That's a key to the de uh, development today. We cannot continue to neglect the small farmers to the country. We must build them up so that they become bigger. So that's my message. A lot is happening. It's all about the political will. We must mobilize that political will. Then we, will, uh, then we are the generation who can remove hunger from the human vocabulary and handle climate change at the same time. Thank Let's you. just do it. Thank you, Eric. Thank you very much indeed. And that's the challenge, isn't it? To stop climate change. I mean, climate change will happen. There will be change. The point is that it should be change and not disaster. And that's where the planning and the policies can come in. William, will you talk to us about your experience as a pastoralist? You talk to us about increasing climate risks and food. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is William Oleseki. I'm a pastoralist from uh, Ngorongoro Conservation Area in northern Tanzania. Maybe some of you have visited that place. It's a, it's a conservation area which was uh, created uh, to accommodate basically three main interests. One of them is conservation. The second one is uh, development of tourism. And the third one is actually human development, pastoral development. People living there are Maasai's. Uh, the bigger percent is the Maasai's. And we are purely uh, involved in pastoralism. The risks that pastoralists face are many and various. This has always been the case. Uh, droughts, uh, floods, and now with the climate change, we even have extremes of all those. Climate, uh, uh, the, the rains that actually grow our pastures and range have diminished, they are so little and they are not dependable at all. And so, in that sense, uh, we are finding it more and more difficult to live entirely on livestock. But let me also say, pastoralism is a highly innovative and an adaptive production system. That is, it uses various uh, strategies to cope with, uh, with risks. One of, the, one of them is uh, transhumans. Transhumans is a system by which uh, herds and the family move to follow and utilize resources, range, water, and salt resources when they are available, where they are available and when they are available. Uh, and this has been a very efficient, it's a very effective way of uh, sustaining uh, 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 pastoral production. But now that is facing a lot of difficulties. In fact, in, in my country today, and I believe it is a case in many other countries, I'm sure pastorals are, are constrained by policies that are not friendly to that particular mode of production. There are so many policies that are actually put by governments which restrain, which constrain that mobility, the movement. So it becomes more and more difficult for us now to access uh, range and uh, water and satellites, which are very important to our livestock. There is also another scenario where now you find a lot of competition from industries like, um, like, like, like agriculture, commercial agriculture. There is also now uh, a lot of uh, competition from mining industry, tourism industry, and these are taking our land from us. We find it more and more difficult to actually now uh, continue with 
the, the, the system because a lot of land is being taken away from us. As I speak with you now, we have a situation in my country where just recently, just two weeks ago, pastoral 60, 65,000 pastors have lost 1,500 square kilometers to a hunting company. And that means you are really causing a lot of trouble. We are now, these pastoralists, we have to stay in smaller and smaller uh, uh, areas where for possibly uh, enough range is not going to be available. So really, uh, we are saying, even though pastoralism has a, lot of, has a lot of capacity and ability, and it has proven to be uh, effective to, to, to in dealing with, in managing risks that arise from various, uh, various, various, various events like climate change, now that ability is being curtailed. It's being, it's being completely uh, squeezed to the limit that it becomes very difficult for us to actually live as we used to be. And that is a very serious threat, not only to our livelihood, but also to our culture. And I think it is very important that we seek from you, as in the international community, support and commitment, so that we actually see to it that pastoralists in the South, and farmers as well, because we are all really victims of land grabbing and um, bad policies that actually, for example, uh, see us, pastoralists, as troublemakers. We are actually, you know, painted as troublemakers, people who want to walk all over the land and all that. So we are asking from you, the support we ask from you is that you support us in the endeavor to, 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 to actually be able to continue with our system of production, with our livelihoods, because if that stops, then we also stop to exist as people. Thank you very much. Thank you, William. <laughs> and thank you for bringing the voice of pastoralists to us, because it's really important that it's heard and, and it's included in the debate. So we have a question we'd like you to vote on now, if everyone has their voting cards ready. OK, and this is the question about risk. So what is the most urgent risk faced by vulnerable people in your community? Is it climate risk and extreme weather events? Is it high energy, high food and energy prices? Is it, in your view, the inequality between men and women? Is it discrimination and the sidelining of vulnerable groups in society? Or is it loss of traditional knowledge, local foods and animal breeds? So it's your choice. You choose between those options and we'll show you the result of that later on. Okay, just take your time and vote there. And while you're doing there, uh, I'm going to introduce to you uh, our next uh, two speakers, our Agriculture Minister, Simon Coveney, who is partnered by Augustine Niamshi, Executive Director of Cameroon Bioresources Development and Conservation Programme. And I suppose it's appropriate, Minister, um, that you're here talking to us about knowledge uh, and the sharing of knowledge. Uh, and of course, you've just signed this agreement between Ireland and the World Food Programme. Thank you. Um, first of all, can I welcome everybody to Dublin? Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, it's great to have more than 30 different countries represented here in Dublin Castle challenging each other, uh, challenging people like me and others, uh, policymakers, uh, to understand the complexities of what you're facing in your communities and in your countries in terms of the extraordinary challenge that I think we all collectively face over the next 10, 20, 50 years. Uh, and as you will hear many times over the next two days, the challenges that we face in terms of feeding ourselves uh, globally, uh, in terms of nutrition and in terms of, of climate change, are going to define this generation. Uh, because by 2030, we need to find ways of producing between 40 and 50% more food in volume terms. Uh, at current consumption patterns, we are going to use 50% more energy than we currently use, and 30% more water than we currently use. 
And at the same time, we have to try and protect the environment and the climate uh, that is our very oxygen for survival. And that's not compatible. So we need to find new ways of doing things, new ways of producing more with less, uh, new ways of doing that, that that don't undermine traditional values and ways of living that define our countries and our communities. Uh, and that is an extraordinary challenge politically, but also for you, many of you who are responsible for implementation of the policies uh, that are put together by governments and by international organizations uh, within your countries and within mine. Uh, and I think that Ireland, uh, and I am responsible for agriculture and food, and indeed the marine and fisheries uh, uh, in Ireland, I think that what we can do um, to make a positive impact on that challenge is first of all to provide a case study for others to follow. Uh, less than two lifetimes ago, Ireland was starving. We essentially had one crop in Ireland. It was subsistence farming that kept people alive, living on potatoes. That crop failed, and we had no policy response to it, and people starved. And they got on what were called coffin ships to head across the Atlantic to try and find a new world and a new place to live. And so this country has traveled the journey from starvation because of failed policy, not failed climate or not failed crops, but failed policy. Uh, and we have, over a period of time, moved to a sustainable form of agriculture. And in the 1950s, Ireland was comfortably able to feed itself with multiple crops. And now we are a country that produces enough food for 10 times our population. And between now and 2020, we want to increase the volume of that food again by about 30%. And also add significant value to that in terms of its nutrient content and in terms of responding to the specific asks of consumers that consume Irish food. And so what I would say to you is that the most compelling uh, reason for policy change is to actually copy what has been done and what has worked, to learn from the mistakes of countries like Ireland. And we have had mistakes in terms of how we've developed a food industry, but also the successes. And of course, it will need to be tailored differently for your own countries and your own climates. But in terms of the ambition, in terms of the empowerment of rural communities that has come from that, in terms of turning the impression uh, and the image of farming away from being peasants and poor people to being significant producers to local communities, as is the case in Ireland. The number of young people studying agriculture in Ireland has increased threefold in Ireland since 2006. The excitement around food production and agriculture and nutrition in Ireland uh, is reflected in the new courses in universities and colleges in Ireland because this is about knowledge. It's about understanding how do we turn natural resources into food in a sustainable way that doesn't compromise biodiversity, water quality, or climate change, but at the same time uh, produces more of what we need to produce to feed growing populations, populations that are moving from a rural environment to an urban environment, populations that are changing their diets from by and large carbohydrate-based diets to now protein-based diets, populations that want to see a lifestyle that we in countries like Ireland are fortunate enough to take for granted. And how do we facilitate that? Because that tide is moving and is unstoppable. How do we facilitate meeting that demand in a way that, that, uh, uh, that solves the extraordinary challenges that we face around climate change? And the answer is science. The answer is knowledge. And the answer is sharing that science and knowledge between countries that spend and can afford to spend significant resources on finding new ways of doing things that are more effective. And sharing that knowledge, is knowledge free of charge as much as possible with parts of the world that can benefit from that knowledge in partnership. 
in partnership, not in a development aid form or a charity form, but in partnership. And that is why you see this country at the moment actually grant aiding Irish companies to go to countries like Tanzania and Kenya, they are the first two uh, pilot projects, and encouraging our food companies to actually uh, uh, develop roots in new economies and new countries to share knowledge, to share ways of doing things. The other point that I'd like to finish on is that this is not just about food production. And it's not about climate change in isolation. And I think one of the failures, certainly, certainly, uh, certainly of the cur current European Union policy, is that we are treating in isolation in some ways the food security and food production policy that we're developing through the common agricultural policy and the climate change policies that we are trying to give global leadership on as a collective in the European Union. But we are not crossing the two together in terms of policy development to the extent that that needs to happen. And we need to challenge our policymakers more in order to do that. And the final point I'd make is in terms of the Irish case study. Food production is about more than just feeding people. It is about also rural communities that rely on each other, that have a self-worth in terms of their contribution to an overall economy. And that is why every country needs to look at templates that have been developed and have worked in other countries and try and apply best practice to their own. And I would give probably as the most effective uh, linkage between food production and the development of rural communities and empowerment of rural communities in Ireland as being the case study that has been the cooperative movement in rural Ireland around milk production and dairy products in general. Uh, and I hope uh, um, that, that that is an experience that we can share in a very effective way uh, with a lot of the countries that are here. So I look forward to your questions and once again, thank you for being here. Thank you, Minister. When you were talking there, Simon, I could see about the sharing of knowledge. I could see your partner, Augustine, sh nodding his head in agreement. And it's important that it's not just, you know, about the, the, the export from countries like Ireland of science and, and, you know, scientific knowledge. It's also about us learning how traditional knowledge and on the ground knowledge means that that can be used to the most practical effect. And Augustine, you're going to talk to us about how traditional knowledge is being used in your project in Cameroon. Please tell us about it. Bonjour. Bonjour. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> My name is Augustine Jamshi. I come from Cameroon. Cameroon is found in the west coast of Africa. It's a tropical country. And I can't agree more than what you've said, Mr. Minister, because for hunger and starvation means, does not mean the same thing for those who have lived it and those who have never had that misfortune of living it. Ireland has gone through that, and I understand you, you're talking from a felt perspective, and thank you very much for that. Climate change, as you know, ladies and gentlemen, is affecting our communities in a big way. The Minister of Trade this morning talked about this woman that goes to her farm every morning to look for food for her children. Now, agriculture is subsistence agriculture where I come from, and it's dependent so much on rain. And we know that climate change is bringing this drought or floods or extreme weather conditions in short. That automatically affects the food production, both the quality and the quantity of food that is produced by our communities. Where I come from, communities have had to go back to <coughs> traditional knowledge and reclaim some of the foods that they used to eat, our forefathers used to eat, because it has been proven that some of these naturally occurring plants, vegetables, and fruits seem to be much more resistant to the extreme weather conditions than the cultivated ones. This means that they are now being forced to go back to what our forefathers used to eat had an opportunity to be fed by my grandmother, who depended so much on wild vegetables, complementing it with grown vegetables in our gardens. But my son does not, did not have that opportunity from my own mother to be fed on those crops, 
on those uh, vegetables. But now, my mother, that I'm using as an example, is being forced to look back in the forest, in the wilds, to get those vegetables, and then trying to introduce it on the table, on the menu. This is knowledge. Now, if we can develop more resistant crops or vegetables, we cannot ignore the knowledge, the contribution that my mother can bring on the table. So it should be a partnership, as you said, Mr. Minister, and not trying to ignore what they have. You know, the world has been plagued with a lot of quick fixing. We always think that there's a solution somewhere that can be taken to the people. At times, it is not accepted. Yes, it goes as long as the project is on. I had the opportunity to talk with the director in the corridors this morning in the state apartment. Some of these well-intentioned programs and knowledge that is passed on to the people in the developing countries turn out not to work the miracles that we think they should work. Not because of anything, but because we've ignored the reality on the ground. So there is a need to balance from the traditional knowledge and the modern knowledge working for humanity. Secondly, we have seen where climate change is affecting the people, as I said, because of the unpredictability of the rainy seasons, the patterns. Now, weather forecast information is not accessible to the communities. You have good information, accurate scientific information for civil aviation. It is not enough to come on the TV or on the radio in the morning and say it will rain next week. For the modern person that goes to the office, he thinks that he should take his umbrella. But for my mother, that is not enough information. It is scientifically accurate, but it's not useful for her. She wants to know whether it is good rain for her to plant her grain. Now, she depends on the season, on the sum of these uh, insects that come up with rainy seasons, with good rains and things like that. Although they are not having that as a, a, a tradition now because of the unpredictability of the seasons. But yet, this information has to be complemented by what happens on the ground. And with that, we can move forward. So modern scientific knowledge, which should be created and made free for these communities, is very critical, blending it with traditional and practical knowledge on the ground. Thank you very much. I thought it was really interesting the way you brought out the links between, you know, even the weather forecast and the information your mother needs. And I mean, very practical, clear example there. And going back to traditional foods and even in terms of the potato famine here, we, we, we now have new varieties of potato that are, are more resistant uh, to, to blight and that is helping our farmers here in Ireland. We're getting a good reaction on Twitter, by the way. Uh, Trevor Nichols says the opening panel is very inspirational. The political will is clearly mobilised, but we need to follow through with action and resources. And that's something we will be developing more throughout the conference. And Masego Madzwanuze said President Banda brings the voice of the poor to the conference, and it's important to ensure sustainable access to food, water and energy. And before we move on to our next section, our right section, we're going to ask you a question now about knowledge and those links um, particular, and it, it, it's up to you here. So our question on knowledge, have we got the knowledge question? That's rights-based, isn't it? And if we had the knowledge question up, that would be fantastic, which is the first, have we got the next slide? Can we get that one there? It's there, brilliant. How best can knowledge be used to address hunger, nutrition, and climate justice? Is it by investing in the protection and promotion of no local knowledge? Is it by the sharing of successful experiences? Connecting local knowledge to scientific research, that's option number three. Is it by ensuring knowledge is free and accessible to all? Or is it number five, to use innovative communication practices and technologies? So whichever you think is the best tactic, uh, the best method 
of ensuring that knowledge is used to address hunger, nutrition and climate justice. Uh, please press that button and when we move into the more general discussion, we'll bring you <coughs> the results of that. Now we're going to talk about rights, because rights is another one of the, the links by which we can, if we tackle it the right way, we can go about solving some of these problems. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to this. Um, we have here Dulcie Lorna Kalmatak. She's the trainer for the Solar Dryer Project in Vanuatu. Her partner is Olivier de Schutter, who's special rapporteur on the right to food for the Human Rights Council. So maybe Dulcie, would you begin by telling us what the Solar Dryer Project is and how this fits into the rights team? Thank you. <coughs> My name is Dulcie Kalmatak. I come from an island country called Vanuatu. It is located in the Pacific Ocean, and the population is around 250,000. Climate change is affecting the right to food in Vanuatu. Extreme weather patterns are changing with sea level rise and causing a lot of coastal erosion. This means that we get a plentiful harvest of fruit and vegetables, and other times we get nothing. This also affects the market, which is sometimes flooded with produce and low prices, and other times produce is scarce and prices are high. These changes patterns of women going to the market to sell their produce. Market is flooded with produce, the price is low, or when the produce is low, the prices are high. To help these problems, I am working with a local community-based NGO as a drainer for solar fruit dryer, working with women's group to preserve fruit and nuts so they can be eaten or sold in off seasons. For example, during cycling season, off seasons, when fresh fruits are not available, you get to sell at better prices in the market. These are hands-on. Sustainable projects like the solar fruit dry uses the sun's energy to naturally dry and preserve fruits such as nuts, crops, and fish. In Vanuatu, the government and the communities are working together to raise awareness of climate change and to promote adaptation programs based on local indigenous knowledge. For example, planting indigenous crops and local trees that are more tolerant to climate change and produce nutritious foods. Overall, the strategy I think we should take is to firstly promote women's rights to knowledge on climate change and adaptation programs using local knowledge and best practices and be able to provide food for their families. While both men and women produce market crops and livestock products, in Vanuatu it is mostly women who go to the market to sell the products. Two, I think we should promote women's land rights. And number three, I think we should promote women's right to food as they are the agent of changes in our communities. Overall, I think traditional knowledge and traditional food systems support both cultural identity and food security. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Dorothy. That's a really interesting point, that women are the agents of change in their society, and that's, that's if we want change, that's where it will have to begin. Um, Olivier de Schutter, you know, people might go, there's food on the one hand and there's rights on the other hand. What's the link between those two, and why are they so important to be tackled together? Thank you, Anne. Um, welcome to all. Let me begin by saying that the objective of the Mary Robinson Foundation for Climate Justice is really to emphasize the, the fact, the injustice, that those who will be most severely affected by climate change are those least responsible for causing it. And, and these people are particularly small-scale food producers who depend on access to natural resources and are at the front line of climate change today. And secondly, the very poor families who spend most of their family budget on buying food, the price of which shall increase in the next few years uh, as a result of climate change. Addressing climate change through that lens, the lens of the poor, the vulnerable, the marginalized, is therefore extremely important. But as Minister Eamon Gilmer said this morning, um, it's a matter of rights, it's a matter of justice and equity, but it also is a matter of practicality. And I would like to answer your question, Ayn, by, by saying that rights are relevant, not because of the symbol they represent, but also because they are operational. We need now to design 
climate change strategies for the mitigation and adaptation to climate change that ensure adequate accountability towards the poor and the vulnerable, that focus on the needs of those uh, poorest uh, groups in society, and we need to do this to empower the poor and to provide them with the opportunity to participate in shaping the solutions that will, um, that will affect them and, and that, will, that will help them. Um, now, the rights that are most uh, affected by climate change are the right to food, the right to water, the right to housing, the right to health. And these rights have been gradually clarified in their content, in the uh, requirements that they impose on governments over the past few years. And if we go through these requirements, we see how completely relevant uh, rights are to identifying the right solutions to address the challenge of climate change. Firstly, under these rights, governments have a duty to, to respect the right to food, the right to health, the right to housing, um, the right to water. And today we have a situation in which climate change increases the pressures on natural resources, in which competition for land, water is increasing, and therefore protecting security of tenure, including particularly for women, is absolutely vital. We have taken steps in this regard, particularly by adopting a new set of guidelines on the responsible governance of tenure of land, fisheries, and forests in the Committee on World Food Security. The challenge now is to implement this further. Secondly, governments have a duty to protect these rights, and that means to regulate private actors um, when the behavior of these actors may threaten the rights of the people with whom they interact, particularly by land grabbing, by speculation over food commodities, and the description of um, William Orley um, uh, describing how pastoralists are losing land to hunting companies in his country is a very good illustration of this. We now know that private actors also have human rights duties that the Human Rights Council has clarified in, um, in recent years. Thirdly, governments have a duty to fulfill these rights, and that means adopting measures that shall strengthen access to food, to water, by promoting agricultural systems that are climate resilient. That means, climate, um, uh, that means agricultural systems that reduce dependency on fossil energy, um, agricultural systems that encourage diversity as a source of resilience. And of course in Ireland, with the experience of the potato famine of 1843, um, we know um, better perhaps than in many other places on earth how important it is to have diverse food systems rather than to be over-reliant on the narrow range of crops. And this is one reason why the Human Rights Council has acknowledged the very clear links between agroecology, climate resilient agriculture on the one hand, and the right to food on the other hand. We also need agricultural systems that reduce the impact of food production on the ecosystems and on greenhouse gas emissions. Today, the food systems have perhaps 30, 33 percent um, um, man-made greenhouse gas emissions accountable to them. Um, why is this important? And I close with this. This is important for essentially three reasons. First, by a rights-based approach, we increase accountability. We ensure that governments shall be obliged to deliver on their promises by being held accountable to their populations and by changing the relationship between governments and populations from one based on charity to one based on rights, empowerments, and duties. Secondly, because participation is key to rights-based approaches, and that means that we will tap into the knowledge of the poor, their understanding of the obstacles that they face, and increasingly in more and more countries, we have platforms for dialogues between non-governmental organizations, small-scale food producers, and governments to ensure that participation is effective. Thirdly and finally, I believe that gender equality a key component of rights-based approaches is absolutely vital for food security strategies to, to deliver. Um, relieving women from the burden that they, that they shoulder, um, recognizing the value of the work that they perform in the care economy, and finally, redistributing gender roles is absolutely key to empower women and allow them to be part of the solution even more than they are uh, up to now. Um, and I look forward to your questions, and thank you again for being here this Olivia, morning. thank you. Now, you've seen this question already, so we'll move to the vote on this uh, rights question now. So the question here is, what is the best way to advance rights-based approaches? 
Your choice is number one, empower people to hold their government to account. Number two, promote inclusive and participative lawmaking processes. Three, raise awareness of human rights at national and local level. Four, support rights with legal frameworks at a national level. So those are the choices that you are being asked to vote on and please press uh, the appropriate button now. Um, and now we're going to move on and talk about uh, empowerment uh, and Arthur and Cousin is with us to do that and also her partner is Cecilia Kibe, the Kenya coordinator of Climate Justice Women Champions. And Arthur and I mean, that word empowerment, th th there may be people in this room who don't even know what it means. What is empowerment and why does it matter in this debate? Well, thank you very much for this opportunity and I appreciate the opportunity to be partnered with uh, Cecilia. She and I had a robust dialogue yesterday talking about the empowerment, particularly the empowerment of women, giving women voice to make a difference in their own lives. And empowerment, is, that is just it, providing an opportunity for those who we serve, those who are impacted by the issues that we're talking about here today, to have a role in and a voice in the outcomes that we want to achieve. The, it's particularly, I think, important that we were last in this discussion because empowerment is part of everything that you've heard, whether it was in risk when we heard the discussion on, in, in the Maasai area on the challenges of addressing risk through conservation, creating an opportunity for tourism, but also by empowering the Maasai. There was, a, there was a recognition that in order to address the issue of risk, you also had to empower the people who were impacted. When talking about knowledge, a recognition that, yes, knowledge is about research, it's about information, but it's also about empowering the voices of those at the local level who have cultural information and knowledge that is value to how we utilize that knowledge for the benefit of creating a more food secure world. And also in the issue of rights. In talking, you cannot discuss rights without also talking about empowerment is a hollow conversation because it is very much about how do you ensure that the dialogue has validity for those you serve and that is ensuring that those, those who, are, who are the subjects of this conversation receive the empowerment that those rights will provide. And so when we, when we talk about empowerment so often in a conversation like this, traditionally, it is a global conversation where we're talking about creating frameworks that support the empowerment of those we serve, whether they're smallholder farmers, fisher folks, or particularly of women. But unless we drive that global conversation down to a national level where the national governments in their structural changes also provide an opportunity for empowerment, it has no value. And again, unless that is driven down to the local level so that the individuals who are impacted by the particular programs, projects, or laws, as you noted, not having the right structural uh, the legislation in place was one of the reasons for the famine that occurred here in Ireland, recognizing that you must have laws that empower people to make the difference in their own lives so that at the center is that woman who from whether we're talking from the global level or at the country level is ultimately empowered to make a difference in her own life. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much. And Cecilia. So Cecilia, talk to us about how women in Kenya have been empowered to be champions for climate justice. So good, af good, af good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's still morning. <laughs> uh, my name is Cecilia Kibe, like you've been lately told. I, first of all, I want to start by saying that I'm happy to be paired up with this strong lady, who is the high-ranking player in the food policy development. Uh, Kenya Climate Justice Women Champions is a national, it's the Women National Network that advances climate justice in the country. 
And uh, we have a, a unique approach where we try to link up the policies with the practices in order to, re to realize the results. Uh, we are working with the 47 counties of Kenya. Those are 47 administrative units according to the new Constitution of Kenya dis dispensation. And I want to go straight to give uh, an experience in one of the counties in the northern Kenya, a place called Trokana. This is a pastoral area where we have a lot of uh, uh, livestock as uh, livelihoods uh, for the communities. But we have been able to identify three very unique problems in that particular area. One of the problems that we have identified is that we have a lot of maternal mortalities. Women die either just before giving birth or at giving birth or postpartum just after giving birth. The problems associated with this is the lack of minerals in the kind of foods they eat and the vitamins. So what happens to the woman? She goes to the labor bed and she tries to push the baby. She's not strong enough, so she dies. The bones have got no calcium enough to make her push that baby out. So she dies in the process. In other cases, a woman delivers and then she bleeds. And because she doesn't have enough blood in the, in the, in the body, she becomes anemic and ends up dying. Uh, we have also observed that we have very high mortality, particularly to the under one year, mainly under six months old babies, because these babies are depending on the nourishment from the mother's milk. So if this woman does not have nutrients required for her to produce the milk, then it means this baby will not get enough of that milk. And I, I'm sure sometimes last year, we observed a case from northern Kenya where the baby was trying to suck from the mother until the, baby, the mother died. The baby didn't, couldn't, couldn't realize that the mother was dead. So the <coughs> baby continued suckling the, the dead mother. It is as pathetic as that. So the, 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 a, little, the a bit lighter one is that um, we have children not going to school because they are hungry. If the child goes to school, psychologically the child knows that there is nothing to eat. They will either learn away from the school or even if they remain there, they will not absorb anything. That contributes to very low performance of academics in the, that particular area. So Kenya Crime Justice Women Champions has tried to empower the women to do a few things that are supposed to elevate the situation. One of the initiatives we have come up with is introduction of the high value indigenous foods. We have picked a case of the green amaranth. I'm sure each one of you knows that it's very rich in, in the minerals, in the vitamins. So the mothers have taken up, the community in general, the mothers and fathers, of course, but uh, we realize the, the, the father doesn't suffer as much as the mother. So, <laughs> so they, are, they are raising those kitchen, uh, kitchen gardens. But because the goats are all over, the kitchen gardens have to be raised up and hung around the, the frames of the houses. Where we do not have high houses, they use the trees that are nearby. So what happens is that we plant in those gardens, the hanging gardens, then we advise the mothers to use the money, they, that, that means to, to use the water they get from the washing the utensils to water that particular garden. So that way they have already realized uh, plucking some leaves and they are eating and we are able to, we are going to evaluate the success. But we, from the indications, there's a lot of improvement in the nutrition of the families. Um, for the children who are, the babies who are sucking, when the mother eats this amaranth, it is translated into production of the milk. It enriches the production of the milk. When I was a young girl, I could see my mother, because I was among the first birds, eating green amaranth, eating sorghum, and the sorghum used to be fermented. fermented. The act of fermentation stimulates the milk let down. People in Kenya, very few people can go for oxytocin injections in order to produce milk. So we are encouraging them to use those high value indigenous crops so that they are able to get enough milk to elevate the mortality of the young, young babies. For those who are not going to school, we are emphasizing on the production, or we are piloting the production of cassava crop. Cassava crop, together with the sorghum, then the, we have trained the mothers how to use the cassava, add value to cassava, then get that 
product of cassava to give to the child when she's going to school. So that come lunchtime, the lunch book has, some, lunch book has something for that baby. And we hope this is going to influence the performance of the academics as well as the health of the children. On the empowerment, Kenya Crime Justice Women Champions is structured from the national level to the grassroots champions. How we do that is we go to the grassroots, we identify the problems, then we identify the leaders who are there, the women who are key, key leaders, not political, but development leaders. So they, they do an election, and democratically, we get representatives from the villages. We come up with all the villages again. We get one at the, the constituency level and another one at the county levels. So these county levels, we are calling them the climate change advocacy champions. And we invite, we do it, we launch it. We invite the leaders of the county to appreciate these women and entrench them in the development agenda. So this particular area, we have already launched uh, a, a county form, forum, a county women forum on climate change, so that these women will go there and they influence the designs and the implementation of uh, the climate response programs, which are eminently absent in the plans. So what I would like to say is that um, uh, we need to empower women. I want to give you a very pathetic case. I was talking about empowerment somewhere in Kenya, and one man stood up and told me, Madam, your presentation is so good, but I cannot empower my wife. She's already a problem to me. <laughs> so it is very, very pathetic. So what we are telling men who are here is, if you cannot empower your wife, please empower your sister and your mother. <laughs> they are sufferers. They are sufferers. <laughs> so finally, finally, because I, I have no time, I want to say this. I'm appealing to all, everybody, in the globally, to recognize that the women are the custodians of life. Of course, partnering with men. So let us empower them. Let us reduce mortalities which are not necessary. When a, when a woman suggests something, it should be taken up because a woman would like to see that child she carried grow to be where she is and even beyond. Thank you very much. Cecilia, thank you so much. That was a fantastic contribution. And it's just heartbreaking to think of women dying for lack of basic vitamins in their diets and the solution. Like all of the right kind of solutions, they, they sound so simple and so right and so obvious when you hear them. Anyhow, here's your question on this issue. What needs to be done to empower people in your community? Is it number one, to engage all the stakeholders, including government, legislators, business and communities? Or you could vote for number two, to remove the barriers to equality of power and opportunity. Number three, and again, this is the most important in your view, is it to build capacity for collective bargaining, advocacy and leadership? Is it number four, create decision-making processes that connect local voices to national processes? Is it number five, highlight gender equality and equity? So those are your choices, and please vote now. Okay, and now um, it's your turn. We want to hear from you and we want to hear from the floor. I'm going to show you the answers to these questions in a minute and uh, just when I get the thumbs up and I know that all the answers are ready, uh, I'll bring you those. But what we want to hear from is you now. Uh, we have the people with the microphones, so if you put your hands up, I'll be able to get somebody. We have three people up here, up the front anyway. We have two people there. We have loads of you. Okay. What I'm going to try and do is distribute a couple of microphones and then go bang, bang, bang and maybe take one point after another because uh, we don't have too much time for this session. Okay, so if we can get two microphones. That gentleman there with the blue spotty tie was the first to have his hand up. This gentleman here who was looking, yes. And if we have somebody from over here, uh, that gentleman there on the edge, is can we get a microphone over here, please? <coughs> Okay, and I'm going to take your questions all together and then bring the panel in on that, and that will just make it quick. So if you tell us who you are and what your question is, please. My name is uh, Moshali Fimutiani, the president of the Lesotho National Farmers Union, a member of the Southern Africa Confederation of Agricultural Unions in the Southern Africa okay. region. The issue of 
political will that the Honorable Minister of Agriculture talked about? Do we have the political will? In 2003, the African heads of state in Mozambique signed what is uh, today called the Maputo Declaration, out of which came the process, the CADAP, the Comprehensive Africa Agriculture Program, where they pledged to put in 10% of the budgetary allocations of, into agriculture, recognizing that agriculture has got to deliver because it serves about 80% of our communities out there in our rural areas and elsewhere right across Africa. And the question? And the question is, no question about that. We have the political will, and all we need to do as Africans is to move, to be moved, and to be supported to the extent that all the African countries are signatories tomorrow of the compact process uh, of the of the CADA. And thanks to the support that is given to us by the EU, EFR, WFP, um, the Irish government, for example, in my country, the Irish government is contributing to us making sure that Lesotho signs uh, the, the compact of the okay. CADA process. And thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Yourself there. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Gregory Akal. I come from Drukana, and I'm currently a student at the University of Cambridge. I'm, I just like to contribute to what William said, to give, to put more efforts on. Uh, there is no pastoralism without uh, w without mobility. So, as pastoralist in the region, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, pastoralists require access to their rights in terms of the land and the movement for them to survive. So the whole question of land grabs that is now happening in the continent is threatening that livelihood. And with failed rains and low yield of uh, crops, livestock play a pivotal role in increased protein for any kind of uh, a family or anybody that is there. So the whole issue is mobility, mobility, and mobility should be promoted. And also the issue of the EU should all the governments, especially the African governments, to implement some of the pastoralist uh, framework that has been already been adopted by these countries. Okay. So more support should be put in place to ensure that uh, as we talk about climate justice, right to food, pastoralists have that right to food, right to water, by whole uh, by uh, supporting all this in terms of there is no ma no man's land or commons. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And I think that whole question of land rights is going to become an increasingly pressing one. Um, in, in you know, in, in it is now and will increase. Yes, yourself here. Um, my name is Chilufia William, coming from Zambia, civil society scaling up nutrition. Um, I've got a question for Eric. Um, how have you? Um, incorporated uh, nutrition in uh, disaster management. And also, I think the other one is just a general question or other comment, is that apart from talking about the struggles for small-scale farmers, I think one thing for certain that we have noticed in Zambia is that people do not know about nutrition, but they know about food. And that is what is causing um, malnutrition. And what has happened also is that um, you have this farmer who has all that it takes to have a good diet. But sometimes they would leave all they have, they don't want even to slaughter, even a chicken, so that they would eat and just have a diet diet for that particular day. So apart from talking about the challenges that the farmers, or rather uh, people, the poor people are facing, but there are also some of the um, things or practices that farmers have been doing that are also contributing to the high levels of uh, uh, malnutrition in different countries. Okay, thank you very much. Th there's two. Th uh, what I'm going to ask the people with the microphones to do is to distribute them to three m more people. I'm going to take some of these questions and, and bring them to the panel now, and I'll come to the votes in a minute. And there's 
two themes really that have cropped up in those questions there. One is land rights and one is nutrition. Uh, that question of nutrition, first of all, maybe Eric, you'd address that point from the gentleman over there. Immediately. Uh, I, I approach it from two very important angles. One is the uplifting of the small scale farmers, because those with no access to nutrition are either normally landless or they're small scale peop uh, farmers in the countryside. Uh, we, we, should, we should do what we're at most to focus in on the small scale farmer and how to make that person, very often a woman, big, a bigger farmer. That was the key topic of the Irish president's speech this morning, and I think it's right into the center of the discussion. Let me mention one other angle. Uh, farm, I mean, climate change, we, t we tend to discuss climate change if it, as it, if basically about temperature. Climate change is not basically about temperature. It's basically about water. Because the all ways climate change are affecting on human beings and nature are basically through water. Too much water, extreme weather events, uh, droughts, in mean different ways uh, through water. So we need to focus in on water, how we manage that. And I believe we need, we need a huge global coalition, a coalition of the willing, I'm not a great fan of George Bush, but I think that's uh, still a very useful concept, where those nations, those businesses, and those civil society organizations who want to move come together to protect, conserve, and develop the great river systems of this uh, globe, because that's where an enormous part of the agricultural production takes part. Okay, William and Olivia, I'm going to bring you in in a moment on the land rights thing, but just on the nutrition point, because I want to finish that. Simon Coveney and Earthwind, please. You know, I, I wanted to make a point on the, on the small-scale farmers, uh, because I think um, there is a view amongst a lot of people that the way in which you produce more food is to simply remove small-scale farmers and replace them with large food-producing corporations within countries. Uh, I think that is a disastrous... <coughs> Uh, thought process, um, and it is possible for countries that have an average farm size that is quite small in international um, uh, benchmarks to actually be highly competitive in terms of how they produce food. But we need to find and design new ways of allowing them to do that. So for example, in Ireland, we are supporting the concept of farm partnerships so that so, so, so that farm families collectively operate together to try and achieve economies of scale in terms of the machinery they use, in terms of the inputs that they buy, in terms of their bargaining power when they're actually selling. If they sell as a collective rather than, a, than as an individual farmer, they're able to negotiate price. Uh, and so there are ways of getting efficiencies and economies of scale and a collective approach towards better ways of doing things and learning from each other without actually removing small-scale family farm structures and replacing them with something else. And that is why it is so important to link food production with rural communities to actually try and keep them intact. So yes, we need to make small farms maybe a little bigger to make them more viable, but we can also farm collectively um, to create a larger farm entity while at the same time keeping family farm ownership and family land ownership intact. Um, and that is also, by the way, uh, an approach that can be taken towards farmers that need to move uh, to, to graze land, uh, that need mobility. Um, uh, again, I mean, we've designed a system in Ireland that suits the Irish uh, climate and structures through what's called a commonage framework program, where you have large areas of land that are state-owned but that are farmed uh, by, by farmers who share that land and have share agreements on that land. Uh, and so, I mean, this is uh, the point that was being made, uh, raised, I think, by all the speakers. There is no perfect solution to any um, uh, uh, one country's problems, but there are certainly themes that I think we can all share, and then we can, through using local knowledge, tailor solutions for individual countries, depending on the crops uh, and the climate that they're operating under and the social structures that they have within rural communities. Uh, but certainly, I think we can learn a lot from each other in relation to what works and what doesn't work. 
um, uh, in our countries. And the idea that we, the way in which we produce more food is to simply remove small farms and family farms, uh, I think that that would be a huge retrograde step and we need to avoid it. And Cecilia, I mean, it, you know, people have this idea about food. You know, food is simply calories. It's not. It's nutrition. And you can have women, as Cecilia was telling us, dying in childbirth uh, because they haven't got the right balance of minerals in, in their diet. Nutrition is the issue there. Arthur. Um, thank you. Very much so. You uh, stole my line. <laughs> <laughs> Very seriously, uh, the WFP, as you know, for the last 50 years has moved large amounts of food to large numbers of people. That's what we've been known for. But there's a recognition that it's not just about the calories. It's about what do those calories compose. And are we meeting the micronutrient needs of those we serve, particularly of pregnant and lactating women and children under two that first thousand days. There was a mention by the questioner of an acknowledgement of the sun movement, the scaling up nutrition movement, which is a platform that includes business, governments, UN organizations, NGOs, as well as community mm -hmm. leaders that ensures that we are supporting at the global level countries that are developing plans to support their own nutritional outcomes. Because there's a recognition that unless we specifically address the issue of chronic malnutrition, as well as food insecurity, that we will continue to do what we've always done, and that is providing food but not meeting the micronutrient requirements. And as a result, what happens is you have the issues of stunting, and we know that in that first thousand days, the failure of a child to receive the appropriate micronutrients results in stunting both mentally and physically, that's irreversible during that child's life. So we know the answers now. We also know the solutions, and it's working together to implement those solutions. Thank you so much, Arthur. And William, I'd like to hear you, because one of the big questions coming from the floor was this question um, about the pressure on pastoralists because of access to land. In your view, um, what could be done, do you think, to, to improve they're listening to the voices of pastoralists and finding solutions that are going to work with them. Yeah, um, I think I, I really concur with you because uh, we know for sure that pastoralism, as any other mode of production, really depends on land. And when land uh, becomes, you know, it becomes grabbed and it's no longer there, then you are simply suffocating that system. And uh, the, the example I just used about what is happening now in my home district, where this land is simply being taken away, it's been isolated, it's been taken away from uh, pastoralists. The problem is our land laws are very clear as to the fact that village lands belong to those villages. No other authority can actually go and um, alienate that land. Now, why? it has happened that despite that very clear stipulations in law, still uh, that is done. I think the, 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 the assumptions are we all understand the kind of power multinational corporations and companies have. I think this has been, this came up uh, very clearly. Uh, in, 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 in actually um, enticing support by, by, by governments so that these lands are actually taken uh, from, from, from the voiceless people, the people who cannot really like, you know, struggle against uh, those injustices. So I think it is really, it is, it's amazing, it's amazing, uh, because despite that the laws are there, still it is happening. And it's not the first time it is happening. You know, we've lost pastoralists, for example, in my country, we've lost a lot of land, for example, to conservation. Many places where you find <coughs> uh, conservation and parks are actually, usually they belong to, to us. Now we've lost them and it is, it is continuing. So I think it is, it's a question of, again I said, it's a question of us, uh, at the international community, really putting pressure on, on our governments to respect those rights because if they don't, then we are, we are actually going to, to be seriously affected.
And that's an interesting point William's just raised there, isn't it, Olivia? That, that, that whole business almost of competing interests, you know, and sometimes what seem to be competing good interests, you know, conserving the environment, the rights of pastoralists. How, how do we balance the rights there? Well, I, I, I think uh, it's a very important way to look at things uh, in terms of comp competition between different priorities and, and different populations. Um, with regard to the comments that were made concerning land rights, I would have two remarks. One is that in this increasingly globalized world, we now have a situation in which populations with widely different purchasing power are competing for the use of the same resources. Uh, just picture that the EU alone needs to satisfy its needs 640 million hectares of land, and that's about 1.5 times its surface. 60% of this land that the EU needs is actually virtual land uh, embodied in the, in the commodities that it imports from the global south. And uh, that puts extraordinarily high pressure on the natural resources of the countries on which we depend. And one very clear example of this is the foolish policy of biofuels being mandated for production in the, in the EU. And there is tomorrow in Brussels a meeting uh, of the EU ministers of energy and transport on this very issue. And I think consistency begins tomorrow morning at that meeting. My, my second remark is that um, we need to support access to land for the most uh, vulnerable rural communities and particularly small-scale farmers, and we all know this. But doing so simply by titling the property that they use, the land that they occupy, to protect them from being evicted without remedy will not be sufficient if we do not allow them also to be more productive on the land that they use. Because if we don't, do not support them, they will end up losing the land after having mortgaged it and having fallen into, into unsustainable debt. And so this is exactly what, what President Michael Higgins was mentioning this morning, mentioning the limits of the De Soto approach to titling, which is very valuable for the urban populations, but perhaps not the magic bullet one might have hoped for for the rural populations. We need to do more than okay. simply title land. We need to empower, we need to equip, we, mean, we need to support and build capacity. All right, there was a lot of good reaction on Twitter actually to the fact that uh, people are telling real stories here at the conference and that's going down uh, very well with people. Um, just world and media saying speakers are making case for unique local knowledge and it's an argument for more scientific research originating in developing countries themselves and I'm being given out to by Glenn Tarman, so I'm going to fix this now because the first four questions from the floor, they were all from men. And this is after a session where we've been talking about the empowerment of women. So any woman with the microphone, stand up and you get to speak. Yes, come on, sister. Have you got a microphone? Let me get a microphone to you and I'm going to go with this lady first and then we're going to go to that lady there. Okay, but these three ladies are our next questions, okay? And my name is Manda Ngoitiko. I'm from Tanzania. We actually coming from the same area with uh, Seki. There are two fundamental questions asked for pastoralists. What can we do? Actually, it is very important for this audience to know that uh, the people who are living now in Ngorongoro district, that they are the same people who have been evicted by the colonial government, by the British government in 1950-59. Those people, they divided into two areas. They came to, the other, the, the, the majority came and settled in the conservation area of Ngorongoro. And actually, there is a lot of problems now. I'm, I'm, I'm going to add a little bit about risk. A lot of children are dying of hunger because the community were given um, a chance to do subsistence cultivation. In 2009, when the region was hit by a very severe drought, this uh, subsistence farming was stopped. And now there is a very big hunger in, 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 the, in, in pastoralist areas. There is also a very much growing pressure um, to stop pastoralism. And this is a disaster because there is no any preparedness. So I think there is, um, there, there is a lot of things that we, there is a lot of uh, issues that to be addressed. Because we need um, to balance the two things. We need to balance conservation and also we need to balance the livelihoods. And I think what is really important is um, 
For example, the Ngorongoro Conservation Area. Every year they are generating uh, something like 52 billion US dollars. But we need to ask you this question. Is the local community getting, what are they getting out of this? There is an equality of distribution of financial revenue to indigenous people in that area. And this is a key question that needs to be addressed. Uh, we also need to ask ourselves, do we have friendly policies, friendly laws that integrate pastoralism with the conservation? Okay, thank you very much indeed. And that's a really strong... No, but I, no, I'm sorry. I'm going to go to the two women. I'm sorry. I'm going to go to the two ladies here. No, I have a. Can I just point out? Look, there is so. You all have so much to say. We're going to be doing the learning circles this afternoon. This conversation is not going to stop here. But for me, I have told these two women that they are going to speak. So I am going to give them their voice here. Please fire ahead. Thank you. My name is Joyce Ngeba. I'm working with a, partner, a partnership for nutrition in Tanzania which is a network of civil society, societies in Tanzania, which are scaling up nutrition. My question is going to the Minister of, for Agriculture, Food, and the, the Marine for the Republic of Ireland. I, wa I would like to know from the Minister how Ireland utilizes traditional knowledge, which can be reflected in the current success in food production, which he narrated few minutes ago. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And our final lady here, yes. I am Kostens Okolet from Uganda. First of all, I will say thank you very much to the Irish government and Mary Robinson Foundation for having done and struggled for what is happening here. We are seeing that light is coming. We are in the dark because of climate change. There's climate justice coming. Just as Mary said, yes, we can. I, am, I have a question to William. He has been talking of uh, grazing animals, land grabbing, everything. What alternative do you have? Because you cannot just go grumbling, with the government and the other. Should you have another... Uh, Some more diversity, another, more another options. <laughs> option to do instead of just that. Because you remember, she talked of one type of food bringing over death the, yes. all over. Okay. And uh, to cousin, this is uh, the World Food Program. In our country, there is a World Food Program, and the World Food Program there, as we are in my country, the World Food goes to the pe people in camps, to the people who are settled somewhere, but the knowledge and, okay, they only give food. They don't give the knowledge, they don't give people of how, how can we get something? And they say, give me the net, but not the fish. Okay. So. Those are some very good questions, Constance. Thank you very much. Thank indeed. you very much. And maybe, Erethrin, you, you deal with that, maybe we just deal with that last one first, about the, the problems, the food going directly into the camps and what people need is knowledge. Yes. Uh, historically, WFP has been very much about one solution, that is providing food when um, there was hunger. There's a recognition that we are not making communities more food secure by simply providing food. And we are expanding from being just a food aid organization to a food assistance organization. That includes bringing the tools into countries that support smallholder farmers through cash for work programs, food for work programs, where we're providing immediate assistance, but also providing the knowledge that will ensure that farmers and, um, and women can feed themselves, ultimately, which is our goal. And we, I will tell you, there are a, a billion, 800 plus food insecure people. We supported 97 million last year. That means that in Uganda and Tanzania, 
for every person that we support, there are those that we do not reach. But our goal is to expand our work and through partnerships like the one that we signed today with the Irish government that gives us the ability to do more long-term planning, to bring more programs that are beyond just the needs of today but supporting the outcomes for tomorrow, we will begin to perform that work. So thank you for that thank you. thank you very much. By the way, I haven't forgotten about your votes. We'll be coming to the results of those in a moment. William, that question about maybe if it's become difficult to be a pastoralist, maybe it's time to think about diversity and also the other point that was made about the distribution of resources, the resources that are generated by conservation. Yeah, on our question, uh, let me just say, um, when I was talking, I, uh, I spoke of pastoralism being a very resilient, but also uh, a very innovative system of production. Um, we are not really only engaged in, 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 in cattle keeping or, or, or livestock raising. Uh, we also do a lot of other things to, to actually complement what we do, and especially at these times when now climate change is taking toll on our, on our, on our stock and herds and all that. Uh, consequently, let me tell you that one of the, one of the coping mechanisms we're actually now uh, trying is, is actually uh, crop farming uh, because this is a, this is this is a, an alternative. It's a fallback. When 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 pastoralism fails, then you always go to other alternatives. Many of our young young men and women are now you know they have gone out seeking for employment. Only unfortunately, they don't get good, good jobs because they are not that educated. They are not professionals, so they end up. Uh, becoming uh, night guards and all that in big, uh, in big cities. However, whatever they get from that is always invested back into pastoralism because pastoralism is more than cattle keeping. It is really also a culture of the people. If, if, you, if you take that, if you take uh, the cattle and the, 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 the livelihood from us, the pastoralists, you've simply destroyed the whole system of survival even. So um, th th we are doing a lot to diversify uh, the livelihoods. Uh, for example, we have a very- Briefly. Yeah. For example, another thing we do normally is um, we have a very good relationship with, uh, with, uh, with farmers. We really depend on each other. And that's why it is very important that when we talk of also rights to land and access, uh, by, by farmers, it's very important because we depend on each other you know, on okay. many aspects. On the issue of distribution of uh, resources, yes, I come from the very uh, area called conservation, Ngorongoro Conservation Area. This area accrues a lot of money from tourism, but very little of it is channeled to, to, to human development. Again, the question is why is this done? It's very difficult because it is the government that decides to do it. It's, it's just a simple negligence. You neglect, you neglect the people who have rights to actually uh, you know, get, get from the government what they, they deserve to get. And because we have, we have given up everything for conservation in that particular place, we ought to be getting, because we are bearing the cost of conservation. The, the tourists who come there, the development of natural resources and, uh, and conservation is really a burden we, we have borne for so many years. And therefore, we must get returns from it. Now, why we don't get it is a big question which I, I, I want every one of us to really think about and possibly uh, contribute towards a solution. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, very, very, very briefly, Minister Coveney, please, because otherwise nobody will ever get their lunch. No, I, I'd just like to ask, uh, answer Joyce's question uh, um, as to uh, what Ireland is doing to, um, to ensure that traditional knowledge and science and research is actually working. Uh, and I would say there are two things that are very important. Um, first of all is education, uh, and second is generational change uh, in agriculture and food production. Because there is an assumption that actually um, uh, amongst food producers that, that the best approach is to protect what they have and not to change uh, because of the pressures that are coming on them. So we must change, but, but we must do it in a way that actually um, uh, farmers are comfortable with, 
uh, and that understands traditional values and so on. So in Ireland, what we have done between now and 2020 is that we have agreed a roadmap for change for the, the food industry in Ireland. It's called Food Harvest 2020, if anyone wants to read about it online. Uh, and that was a policy that was written by the industry, including farmers, including food processors, food exporters, academics, government policymakers, and so on. And so we have a, a set of targets that we have to meet quarterly every year. Uh, and I chair the implementation group for that as the main policymaker. But there is buy-in from everybody, whether it's young farmers, old farmers, or, or even people who are buying Irish food outside of Ireland to ensure that we remain on track. And I think that type of collective approach is necessary. But ultimately, we need to get new minds, young minds that have been educated uh, into food production to do things differently, to understand how they can do things differently, uh, and they need to be supported uh, by that, by the state, uh, and by international agencies such as, uh, such as the ones that are represented here today. Minister, thank you. Very final word, Eric. The issue of how to combine conservation of nature with human development is, of course, absolutely essential. But here there is a great global success story, and that is the UN Red, the, all the uh, efforts which has been done over the last few years to conserve and sustainably use the world rainforest. Huge number of people have come together with this effort, and it has been enormously successful. The, by far the most successful story is the story of Brazil. Brazil has reduced the deforestation rate in the Amazon with 80%, 80%. No one thought it possible. At the same time, exactly in the same period, Brazil has been one of the world leaders in bringing people out of poverty. Poverty, extreme poverty in Brazil has declined enormously. So they have been able to do both at the same time, both conservation, as well as poverty alleviation. Uh, and because they understand that you can not only protect nature, you must also provide alterna alternative livelihood and uh, industrial and agri agricultural prospects for people. So these people tell you that you cannot combine conservation with poverty alleviation. Just one word is the answer, Brazil. <laughs> Listen, can you please, thank, I, I know this conversation could go on for so much longer. I know there are people who feel frustrated. You haven't been able to take part in it yet. Can I just say, it, this conversation is continuing throughout this afternoon. We will have more dialogues again tomorrow morning. These questions are not over. We will get a chance to talk again. But people have to eat, and there is more work to do this afternoon. So I'm afraid I have to draw this conversation to a conclusion here. Would you please thank our whole panel? It's been a really interesting discussion. Thank you all. So while our panel leaves the stage, and this is like the Eurovision, it's a, it's a thing we have here in Europe, um, we're going to bring you the results of your votes. Um, so what question, the question one I have is, what is the most urgent risk faced by vulnerable people in your community? What was the result there? 34% went for number four, discrimination and marginalization of vulnerable groups in society was seen as the most urgent risk. That's interesting. Are you sure? Okie doke. Next question. How best can knowledge be used to address hunger, nutrition and climate justice? So what way did you vote on that? 43% went for option number three, which is the connection of local knowledge to scientific research. It's really interesting. People are going for that connectedness thing there. Okay, next question. What is the best way to advance rights-based approaches? So those were your four choices. What did you choose? 53% went for option number one, empowerment, uh, empowering people to hold their governments to account. And then what needs to be done to empower people in your community, therefore? Is it to engage all the stakeholders and so on? Those were your choices, five of them. 33%, big majority, going for option number four. Create decision-making processes, connecting local voices to national processes. That's a really important vote. Thank you all very much. Give yourselves a round of applause there. Now, when President Higgins was talking to us earlier this morning, he asked the question, 
Can words be translated into actions? Can change really happen? Are we ever going to live in a world where children actually do grow up free from hunger? Where they not alone grow up free from hunger, but they grow up well nourished? Where climate change does just mean change and not disaster? Is that world actually possible? Mary Robinson spoke about 2050. I mean, is that all just pie in the sky? Are we all just dreaming? Well, maybe not. Because now you're going to meet two young men who believe it is possible that that world can be achieved, the real world. And it's going to happen in their own lifetimes. So I want you to sit back and enjoy a little bit of inspiration now, because we all need a bit of inspiration from time to time. This is their vision of the, how the world might look in 2050 and how we might all get there. So would you please welcome Youth Ambassadors Alex Nallo from Sierra Leone and Sally Hussein from Palestine. Please give them a very warm welcome. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The voice you'll be listening to in the next minute is the voice of Alex Nalo Jr., 23 years old, World Vision International Youth Ambassador. Friends, I grew up in a small town in Sierra Leone called Bo. We are my family struggle with issues of hunger and food insecurity. Like many other families, acquiring daily food was a major challenge and children who are malnourished, we are and are still a common sight. I grew up challenging myself that if the situation has to change, then I must play a role. My motivation to start engaging in awareness raising and advocacy around household food security, prevention of malnutrition among children and efforts to protect environment stem from the childhood experiences as well as the desire to be part of the change that we must bring to bear on the lives of the future generation. Despite improvement in economic growth over the recent years, 26%, that's about 1.5 million Sierra Leoneans cannot afford, cannot afford adequate daily food intake to sustain healthy life. Over one third of children that are due to malnutrition, resulting in 36% 36, 36 of children under the age of five being stunted. I am sharing this with you. And you have had lots of global figures and statistics today to indicate to you the enormity of the challenge we have at hand and the urgency of the required action. If Sierra Leone and many other countries in Africa and Asia and other parts of the world are going to make significant progress towards the Millennium Development Goals, it requires redoubling of efforts and investment and a commitment that is driven by our conscience and responsibility of our world. I want to see my country and the world move from a theory-based approach of development to a practical human development approach which takes bold and courageous efforts in addressing hunger, nutrition, and climate justice. When I was a member, and later president of the Children's Forum Network in Sierra Leone, I engaged myself in awareness raising on the challenges faced by children, which affected their well-being, nourishment, health, and education. As a child leader in 2008, I mobilized children to take to the case of parents, civil society, and government for increased investment and accountability in food security, in communities, improved nutrition programs, for children and environment protection. I became a youth ambassador when I, was 18, when I was 18 in order to continue advocating for sound policies and programs that address fundamental challenges to this millennium, food security, climate change, and malnutrition. I believe that decision makers can work together to reduce emission, protect the environment, promote nutrition and improve food security, with the common goal of improving children's life. I'm here to appeal to you all that now, more than ever, we need a more collaborative approach, partnership among governments and institutions, amongst people of various backgrounds and cultures to step up to this new challenge. More awareness, sensitization, education, 
should be directed at young children and the youth who will grow up with the responsibility of changing their homes, their country, and the world at large as we move forward for Vision 2015. I am passionate about these issues because we will inherit the challenges of hunger, malnutrition, climate change, and its consequences. The post-2015 development agenda needs to respond to our own needs, dreams, and aspiration in making our communities and the world a better place. We need to actively, you need to actively listen to my voice and the many voices of the young people as well as, and the many voices of the young people as who will be parents, decision makers, and leaders of not only tomorrow, but who are leading now in the bid to safeguard many children and young people whose lives have been negatively impacted by the issues we are talking about here today. 2015 shall not be our limit. As I thank the organizers for making my voice to be heard today, which I believe is a voice that echoes the voices of the many young people around the world, Africa and beyond. I am willing, and as a leader, you are, you are already here today because you are part of the coalition of the willing. And with you, we can move forward for a better world that is hunger-free, well-nourished, and climate-just. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you all. Hunger-free, well-nourished, climate-just. That's something we can all dream about. Let's hear the dream now of Salah Hussein, World Vision Youth Ambassador from Palestine. Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon. My name is Salah Hussein. I'm from Zeta, a small village near Nablus City. I'm 20 years old. Uh, I would like to thank you for your invitation to be here in Dublin. Uh, in Conference of Hunger, Nutrition, and the Climate Justice. I'm from Zeta, a small village near Nablus, famous of olives. Zeta depends on multiple source of income. The most important of this is agriculture, where people in my village cultivate crops, olives, and vegetables. In Zeta, we are facing climatic change, such as a highly uh, variable rainfall, as well as heavy storm, cold winter, and high temperature in the summer. Up to five years ago, Winter and summer were predictable. Now, the weather has changed a lot, with a hot and cold day possible in a, uh, one week. Uh, this change affects our uh, crops in positive and negative way. We are now uh, growing some crops and the tree uh, in, in Palestine that we couldn't grow before. But on the other hand, a high temperature when all of the trees are in flower destroy the crop. Um, Palestine is agriculture country providing much of the food uh, needed to feed population. But there is a high rate of hunger, especially in Gaza Strip and West Bank. There are uh, several reasons for this, including the impact of climatic change and the, fa the, the fact that our farmers prevented to reach their uh, land to cultivate their crops uh, because of the occupation, settlement, and declaration of mil military zones. The blockage in the Gaza Strip is increasing the rate of hunger, as well as reducing the space for fishing in the sea. It's also increasing the price of food and other products, which is uh, another reason why is the hunger in the country. I am driven to do what I can to help, my, uh, to help people in my country to have a better life. One year ago, I started to work with a local farmer co co cooperative in my village with the three of my friends. We help the farmer to improve packaging and marketing their products so that they, couldn't earn, they could earn more money and create new jobs for young people in the village. I also introducing the farmer to some of my invention. In Palestine, farmers is in, in living in the village like Zeta, often some distance from uh, the, the village and the land that uh, they are uh, cultivate. So I help them to use sensors to alert them when uh, animals get into their fields so that can uh, go their land and chase them away before destroy the, the crops. 
I am an inventor of a lot of things, from automatic refrigerator door to sensor tell you when the power cut off and the food in your freezer has expired. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that, uh, that being inventive and creative is very important so that young people are able to solve a problem, including the climate change and hunger. I am an optimistic person. And I believe if we start to solve the problem of hunger and the climate change now, it will be a good future. However, if we only think about what we have to do uh, without a real action, it will be a pessimistic future for my generation and generation after me. Uh, I am an inventor, but even these skills, there is a limit what I will be able to do 13 years uh, from now if I'm living in a world affected by climate change. As a part of my work, I teach children how to be inventors and how to solve a problem. But if these children come to my class hungry, how they can learn, how they will be able to be inventors for tomorrow if their stomach are empty. In Arabic we say, when food isn't present, the mind is absent. Young people, have a new way of thinking in 21st century that is different from the old way. We use social media. We could connected with a youth from other regions and country, and we share our problem and solution. Finally, I would like to say that young people always speak from the heart, and so it's important to hear them. And I would like to conclude by saying young people have a flame of creativity, but they need someone to light it. Thank you.